Thank you, thank you, Penelope, so much. Good morning and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ. It is good to be worshiping together in this heat of the summer time. Whether you are worshiping in the bigger balcony or here in this space, our spirits are together. And it is a joy to be one community. I have several announcements for us this morning as we begin. Um, First, my name is Sharon Benton, and I get to be the lead pastor here, and that is such a joy for me. And um, as we introduced last week, Paige is our sabbatical pastor, who is here while Davi is on their sabbatical until November 1st. And to begin, I want to share with you that next Sunday, we will be having our All Questions Considered sermon. So Paige and I will be answering your questions that you pose for us. We will not read them ahead of time, um, but we hope to be able to have a good time. It's, It's usually a lot of fun. The back page of your bulletin has open space, you can tear it out and um, write a question or two and put it in the offering plates on your way out of the sanctuary or drop them in Sidney Cochran's mailbox in the church office. The Grandparents Support Group has its first gathering this coming Thursday, 10.30 to noon. It'll be in the fireplace room. Um, If you have any questions about that, you can see Joyce Sweeney or Deanna Murray or Bill Lidicote. Um, Family Promise, our time serving with Family Promise is coming up again. Monday, August 21st, that's next Monday, we'll be providing two families with meal kits. So if you are interested in helping to build those meal kits for Family Promise, again, please see Joyce Sweeney. Stephen Ministry. Many of you are aware of our Stephen Ministry. It's, it's a group of folk who are trained to sit and care and talk with you when you are going through a difficult transition in life. You know, sometimes it's the birth of a child and learning what it means for your home to be newly awakened into this experience of another life. And maybe you need somebody to walk with you through that. Or the death of a family member and you've got some grief. Um, 
All kinds of life transitions are what Stephen ministers walk with us through. And we are planning a new training for folk interested in becoming Stephen ministers. Um, it will start this fall, um, and there are there's a red folder which is on the welcome desk in the narthex with um, applications for that. But if you have more questions, you can find somebody who has a blue name tag or talk with Kathleen McGinnis um, about what it means to be a Stephen minister. Gathering in Sunday is coming soon. It is going to be on September 17th this year, and we are hoping to have a grand picnic after worship, as we did. We've scheduled Squalicum Creek Park once again, and this is for all ages and all people to join us after worship, but we are looking for some folk to help host that. Um, purchasing food, set up and clean up, things like that. If you have a little bit of time for this one-time ministry of helping us with gathering in Sunday picnic, please see Jean Scribner, um, and she can help you with what we're doing. Um, and finally, a celebration. Friends, this week, our solar panels are finally being installed. Yes! Thanks be to God and thanks be to all of the volunteers who have helped make this happen. This has been a, at least a decade in the works and they are going up this week. It also means that there will be construction, so please be aware of that if you come into the church parking lot. And on Wednesday or Thursday, we will lose power to the church building uh, for a few hours. We don't know when yet, but just please be aware that that is going to happen. But mostly, just let's thank God that this is, this is something that's going to happen and the work that has gone into that. Which leads me to this message. No matter who you are, and no matter where you are on life's journey, whether you are celebrating this morning or you are holding some form of grief, whether you know exactly what you believe and you can proclaim your Christianity from the rooftop, or if you are still wondering, still seeking, still questioning, all of this is welcome here. You are beloved of God. Let's enter into our time of worship. The story of our text this morning Joseph of Arimathea shows up in our texts late on the day we call Good Friday, the day Jesus was executed. Joseph, we are told, was a member of the council, the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish authority in Israel at the time. One of some 70 judges, the very judges who tried Jesus and sentenced him to death. But instead of meeting up with the other judges to share some wine and bask in their collective relief, Joseph makes a visit to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. See, the Sabbath was approaching, and Joseph wanted to quickly provide Jesus with a proper burial before the day of rest began. Otherwise, Jesus' body would have had to hang there for days. Joseph meets Nicodemus at the tomb there with Jesus' body, and together they prepare Jesus and place him in his resting place. This was an act of love and respect that would put Joseph at odds with his religious colleagues and many in his community. Please rise in body and spirit and join me in the call to worship. When the way is difficult and dangerous, let us choose what is good and just. When evil comes to break us down and break us apart, let us choose to carry on with each other. 
when power from on high strikes fear in our hearts. Let us still choose the courage to persist, for we know that the love of God which abides in us will not be overcome. Amen. Amen. If you prefer to stay in your seats during the passing of the peace and experience peace just within yourself, please do. But otherwise, I invite you to connect with others and share the peace of Christ as much as you are able. Type it online, call a friend, shake hands, give hugs, whatever it is for you to do this morning. The peace of Christ be with you. piece of You know, we're going to continue on. I get to read from the book right now, Real Kids Speaking Up for Change. Oh, how about that? So today's additional reading is from our All Church Read Companion book right now, Real Kids Speaking Up for Change. And I'm reading about Bobby Novak. May the Spirit speak in... Oh, this, I'm supposed to read that after the reading. Okay, got it. Okay, so here's a picture of Robbie.
Robbie Novak was eight when he made the first Kid President video, an idea that came from his brother-in-law Brad's belief that kids have voices worth listening to. Together, they filmed over a hundred videos that inspired people to laugh, be kind, and find joy. After a three-year break, the brothers returned to YouTube with new videos that highlight other kids, especially those who are making the world a better place. Lights, camera, action. A boy and his brother film a playful video, then another, and another, and another. Joy, laughter, dancing, singing. A wise and silly kid president, sometimes wearing his swim trunks, reminds us to have fun, dream big, and fill the world with love. And that's a wrap. So this morning, we're going to invite prayers from all of you again. So if you've got something on your heart or mind, we will listen for you. But first, today let's hold prayers for Deanna's sister, Denise, and brother-in-law, Virgil. Prayers for healing and support. And Mary Cheney asks prayers for Michael Meyer who last week just moved into the memory care unit in Bellevue and has now contracted COVID. So prayers for Michael and Mary and all in that memory care unit. Prayers for the library in Dayton, Washington, which is facing closure for having LGBTQ books on its shelves. And prayers for the people, animals, and spirit of Maui mm. after the great devastation this week and the continuing challenge. Prayers for all affected there. So if you would, if you have something that you would like to share out loud, please raise your hand and Paige or I will come. What do you pray for that today? I'd like prayers for my good friend Shirley Cobb, who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Hmm. Frenchie asks our prayers for her friend Shirley, who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Larry. I'd like prayers for my son Brad, who with his brother Eric are moving across country as we are meeting. Uh, Brad is moving from Minnesota to Oregon. Larry asks prayers for son Brad and brother Eric as Brad is moving from Minnesota to Oregon as we speak. Thank you. Yes. For Marilyn, who is part of this congregation and living in New Orleans and, uh, with dementia. For Marilyn, who's part of this congregation, is living in New Orleans and has dementia. Thank you. If there are no other spoken prayers, let's hold a moment of silence. Holy One, you have given us community where we might share the joys and celebrations of our lives and where we might share the burdens that we carry, the griefs, the challenges, the hurts, knowing that we are not judged for how big or little our pain is, but we are held in love that is bigger than all of us. We come together in prayers for all who have memory loss, whether new or long time, 
for the loved ones that surround them and so often feel invisible in their caregiving. May we remember all of them. May we also hold all of those who are facing transition, the life changes that come. God, sometimes it doesn't feel fair and sometimes it feels like there should be a reason, but so often there isn't. And so all we can do is hold the love and the grief together. God, we ask healing for all of those who need it, those who are in our, mar- in our minds and not spoken aloud. And God, we hold this earth and the changes that this earth has been experiencing because of our actions over generations. We ask healing there as well, O oh God. For all of this, and more that we hold deeply in our spirits, we join our voices together and pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our reading today is from Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 46. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were really dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I would invite any young people, any children who want to come forward, whether you're in the bigger balcony or here in the sanctuary, do you want to come and join me for just a couple minutes? Maybe. Do you want to join me, Nolan? No? Okay. Well, I've got this thing. I'm wondering if you know what it is. Hmm. Theo's here. Hi, Theo and Eliza. All right, so do you all know what this is? Does anybody know? Do you think you know what it is? So I've got this mirror here. And you know, sometimes adults, we get a little silly. Sometimes adults look in the mirror and we start thinking, Ooh. I don't like this wrinkle here. And oh, sometimes we think, is my hair getting gray? Look, I can find gray hairs. Sometimes we think, oh, I wish I had a smaller nose. Adults are silly sometimes, aren't we? I've got this mirror here. What do you see in the mirror? Anything? Do you see anything? Tilted that way. Oh, thanks adults for telling me. (laughs) What do you think? What do you see in the mirror? Can you see yourself? You can? You can see yourself? Do you have this wrinkle here? No, you don't. What do you see? I see brown hair and no hair and blonde hair and red hair. I see arms and legs and eyes. What do you think? What do you think? God hopes you see in the mirror. I'll tell you what I think God hopes you see. Can you still see yourself? You can? Okay. I think God hopes you see a good mom. Somebody who really loves her kiddos. I think I see, and I think God sees another good mom who loves her little baby boy. I think God also sees somebody who likes to make people laugh. I think I see somebody who tries to be a good brother and cares about his sister. Yeah? I think somebody agrees with me. I think God sees somebody who tries to take care of others and love them with all her heart. You know, sometimes we look in the mirror, I think, and it's okay to see the things we don't like about ourselves. But I think God hopes we also can see that there's more about us 
that is wonderful, that is loving, and that is full of God's love. Is there anything else you see that I didn't name? You think about it today, okay? Next time you look in a mirror, think about, what do you think God sees when God looks at you? God, thank you for loving us and thank you for showing us the parts of ourselves that are sometimes hard, sometimes hard to face, and sometimes we don't like as much. But thank you even more for showing us those things that you know about us, that you hope us to be the very best we can. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Good morning. It's good to be here with you again this second Sunday. Um, will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, I have meditated over words based on my experience and love. Will you take these words and shape them into messages of comfort, liberation. Oh God, my safe place and way maker. Amen. Windows and mirrors. That's what they call it in education. We want children to have a window through which they can view and understand the lives of others and build respect for diverse experiences and mirrors, books, stories, science within which they can see themselves, their own experience. When we don't see ourselves in the world around us, we struggle with making sense of it all, integrating information, applying what we learn, feeling like we belong. Same is true with the Bible and the stories of our faith. You'll have to forgive me for all the drinking today. We are turning our sermon series to an inward look through the story of our biblical characters. When we read about the folks from our faith history, how do we see our own story reflected? What do we see in the mirror of the text? Our own struggles and joy? Our own faith? This is just another opportunity for us to look for ourselves among the pages of the Bible. Today we begin with the story of Joseph of Arimathea, Thea, Thea, not sure. Not a well-known figure, as he only appears during the burial story in our canonical text, but a rich character nonetheless. So, who was this guy? First, he was powerful. He was part of the Sanhedrin, the high priests of Jerusalem. These folks were like the supreme court of Jewish religious life. The very group, by the way, who had tried Jesus and sentenced him to death. He had direct access to Pilate. He could approach him personally and ask for the body of Jesus. Not just anyone could walk into the house of the Roman governor and ask for something. And he was wealthy. He owned the tomb in which Jesus was buried, and he's described as wealthy by the Gospel of Matthew. 
But what stood out about Joseph and the other members of the Sanhedrin was their devotion to God. As Christians, we need to be very cautious in our descriptions and assumptions about ancient Jewish leaders. It's easy, I think, to slip into this depiction of them as uh, power-hungry money grubbers, right? With the advantage of hindsight, sure, it's easy to see the ways that both state and religious powers were protecting themselves by condemning Jesus. But this wasn't and isn't a uniquely Jewish or Roman trait. This is a human trait. Fear of losing our power, our comfort, fear of losing our place of belonging can lead us into some pretty regrettable actions. So I want to spend just a moment more talking about the Sanhedrin in that spirit. There were criteria for being appointed a judge. The judge must demonstrate these seven traits. Wisdom, humility, awe of heaven, a loathing for money, even one's own, and most of them had a great deal, a love for truth, a love for the people at large, and a good reputation. Doesn't sound like power-hungry money grubbers to me. Sounds like people gathered together around common values to do good for the people. But there's more. Judges must have achieved a distinction in knowledge of the Torah. These were very educated religious leaders, devoted to studying the Torah and living a faithful Jewish life. Joseph of Arimathea would have spent decades of work, study, and devotion to this life. He was fully bought in, you could say. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. He was a seeker. My guess is that he'd always been a bit of a seeker. His commitment to exploring the questions of God, faith, and society propelled him down a road of study and among people who shared this passion. And all of that added up to holding a powerful place among Jewish religious life. Sitting on the Sanhedrin was, in effect, the natural result of Joseph's curiosity and quest for understanding. And then Joseph finds himself in the midst of a great dilemma. He has come to a place of serious disagreement with the Sanhedrin. If not the spirit of the Sanhedrin, then at least the decision of the current judges, this decision to condemn Jesus. The day Jesus was executed, Joseph intervenes to have the body taken down from the cross and brought to him before the Sabbath was to begin. He went to Pilate, he asks for the body, and then he proceeds to honor Jesus with a proper burial, herbs and ointment, cloths and tomb, the body of a political villain, a heretic, a false prophet, a body that had been humiliated. This was a risk. Luke tells us that Joseph had not consented to the decision of the council to execute Jesus. John tells us that Joseph was afraid, and Mark tells us that it took courage for Joseph to approach Pilate on that fateful afternoon. Joseph knows that his powerful Jewish friends will not approve of his decision to show mercy towards Jesus. He knows that providing this proper burial will out him as someone who found Jesus compelling someone looking for the kingdom. Joseph's loving treatment of Jesus is an outright rejection, if not even a rebuke of the public position of the Sanhedrin. And I find myself wondering why someone with so much power and influence, with so much comfort, with so much distance from suffering of the world, would put himself at risk like this. He wasn't in a desperate spot. He didn't somehow need to go out on this limb, but he does it. Because that's what we do. When we reach the fork in the road, where carrying on the easy way feels like dying, and veering off onto the risky path is saying yes to life. Have you ever been in a similar situation? Have you ever found yourself surrounded by people you thought you knew? who you thought you shared values with only to realize that you were using the same words to describe a very different vision? Have you ever wandered along thinking you were doing it all right, fulfilling all the shoulds, only to find yourself in a place of sadness, anxiety, meaninglessness, 
just glimpsing a life of purpose from the outside? Have you ever felt like if you told the truth of what you think, if you spoke up about what matters most, if you made a big and risky change in your life, that the people you rely on would cast you out, smear your name, reject you, even punish you? That is a lonely and scary place to be. It can really make you wonder who your friends are. It can really spark an identity crisis. I wonder how Joseph felt that evening as he tended to Jesus' broken body. Did he think about what the other members of the council would say when they found out what he had done? Did he think about the friends he might lose? What could happen to his family? Would he lose his income, his home? Did he doubt himself in those moments? Was he conflicted? Was he determined? Was he all of the above? Who was he now that he had turned his back on the Sanhedrin? What about everything he had worked for and committed himself to his whole life? Was all of that lost? I wonder if the Psalms were ringing in his ear, and you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me, save me. Be to me a rock and a refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and the cruel. For you are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned since my birth. The Gospel of John tells us that Nicodemus was there with Joseph, caring for Jesus' body, so he wasn't entirely alone. But the two of them knew they didn't stand a chance against the voices of the state and religious authorities. And the apocryphal Gospel of Peter tells us that Joseph was put into prison by the Sanhedrin when they discovered what he had done, only for the risen Christ to appear to him and free him. There comes a time for all of us when something doesn't feel right in our gut, something gnaws at us. It could be small, could seem small even, something like an offhand comment that hits you as uncompassionate, mean, maybe even just a little bit hateful. Could be snarky. Could sound like someone repeating a hurtful trope or name calling for no reason other than the way someone else shows up in the world. Name calling, what's with name calling? It could be something big that gets our attention, a grave injustice, profound harm to others or the earth. Whatever it is, we are posed with a choice. Joseph reached the end of his line that day, watching Jesus die. He understood that something very, very wrong had happened, and he couldn't keep carrying on as he had been. It was a moment almost of forced transformation. It was his moment to step out of the comfort of the life he had spent so much time building and dig into his seeking ways and strike out in a new and uncertain direction. Um, I am not the kind of preacher that looks for resolution in my stories. I was really happy just to end this sermon by recognizing that we all come to these places in life where we depart from our past and grab hold of something new and more compelling, right? It's something I've lived it's something I felt, but then it hit me as I considered Joseph's identity crisis. Oh, crap. Paige, you have to say this. Joseph finds his identity in following Jesus. Joseph's identity becomes following Jesus. Now, that sounds a lot like the faith of my childhood, a way of understanding Jesus that I walked away from a long time ago for really good reasons, and so I want to be clear about what I mean. By finding his identity in Jesus, I mean Joseph found a new way of being in the world, a way that was all about love and mercy. He witnessed a very tangible Jesus, something hard for us to do, who walked and talked, who breathed and screamed and wept. I imagine Joseph watching Jesus from a distance, taking note of what he said and did and who he surrounded himself with, and I am reminded of my hero, Dorothy Day's description of Christ in The Long Loneliness. Many years ago, she wrote this. The great mystery of the incarnation, which meant that God became man 
that man might become God was a joy that made us want to kiss the earth in worship because his feet once trod the same earth. It was a mystery we accepted, but there were also the facts of Christ's life, that he was born in a stable, that he did not come to be a temporal king, that he worked with his hands, he spent the first years of his life in exile, a refugee, and the rest of his early manhood in a crude carpenter shop in Nazareth, he fulfilled his religious duties in the synagogue and the temple. He trod the roads in his public life. And the first men he called were fishermen, small owners of boats and nets. He was familiar with the migrant and the proletariat. There's some time-bound language. He spoke of living wages, not equal pay for equal work. He died between two thieves because he would not be made an earthly king. He lived in an occupied country for 30 years without starting an underground movement or trying to get out from under foreign power. He directed his sublime words to the poorest of the poor, to the people who thronged the town, who hung around sick and poverty-stricken at the doors of rich men. I wonder if something Joseph heard Jesus say somehow tended to Joseph, somehow brought him comfort, somehow was a mirror that reflected back his own internal compass, helped him to better understand that God loved Jesus, Joseph not because of all that he had done right, not in spite of his woundedness, not from a distance, but immediately, and simply because Joseph existed. I wonder if Joseph had always had misgivings about his place of power and wealth, if something had gnawed at him when he saw a homeless woman sleeping in a doorway. Something had called to him and said, this woman is your sibling, help her. And then he saw Jesus do just that. One thing I love so much about this story is that it shows it's never too late to say that yes to life. Jesus had died. For all Joseph knew, the story was over. But he had seen and understood something he could not unknow, and it changed him. When we come to know something we can't unknow, we have changed too. The people around us don't always change right along with us. We can lose our old place of belonging, our old comforts and conveniences. But you know, with Jesus, that's never the end of the story. Because when we step into that story with Jesus, when we say yes to more life, there is new belonging that emerges, a new comfort. And it is richer and realer and more enduring than what we've left behind. In texts outside our canon, we hear stories of Joseph traveling far and wide, sharing the gospel. He's a saint now. And for all that he lost and the high price he paid, I'm guessing he wouldn't have taken any of it back. I bet he thought it was worth it. Is there something gnawing at you? Is there a liberation just waiting for you to risk grasping it? It may not be easy, but it will be good. It will be worth it. Did you already do the thing that you knew you had to do? Have you been a daredevil for goodness? Have you paid the price? lost those friends, endured the shaming and rejection? Well, you are among friends here now. You belong with us. A people gathered to live out God's dream for this world, to live mercy and justice, curiosity and compassion, and to feel in ourselves the rewards of a life well lived. Wherever you are in this quest for goodness, just know you are not alone. You live in God's world and all things are being made new. Amen.
is our strength. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our refuge. God is our strength. So we will not be afraid. Almighty So Paige called me up this week and said, would I be willing to do a testimony? And I said, yes! And then after I hung up, I thought, oh. (laughs) What does that mean? She gave me a question. Where does God show up for me? Thank you for the question. This has been a big week. I don't know about you, but I'm mourning for Hawaii. All those critters, all the trees, all the people. I haven't figured out how to respond to that yet. But this week, I have experienced gratitude in many ways, and I feel like that's a gift from the Holy Spirit. A friend with similar family concerns, when I asked her, can I call you any time? And she looked at me with her full presence and said, yes, you can call me at any time. Gratitude. I cook, clean, and garden with the companionship of music. My past and present aging self wanted a spiritual hug with familiarity and yet a freshness. Apple Music revealed Paul Simon's seven psalms. I feel tremendous gratitude for being there just at the right moment, pressing the right button to receive that gift. I get deep comfort from Paul's voice that I've grown up with. My children say, oh, Mom, please, no more diamonds on the soles of our shoes. (laughs) 
deep comfort from Paul's voice, and new lyrics that are a witness to his long life that comfort me as I get old. Gratitude. A withered, crispy geranium in my shade garden was a reminder of my not-so-budding garden skills. I wanted to just toss it. I moved it to the sunny deck. Guess what? Prolific flowers, bright green leaves, are in abundance. I didn't give up on that plant. I don't think God gives up on me either. Gratitude. Green Team. This week, Green Team met via Zoom. All these faces popped up on the screen, and I felt gratitude for each and every person. Devoted folk gathering to plan how best to serve our church and wider community at this time of climate crisis. The gifts of time and talent were offered. I thank God for gratitude. God helped me recognize the gifts, and I felt gratitude. Amen. Before the benediction, I just want to say a word of thanks um, for the beautiful music this morning. Thank you, One Accord. And to David and Nancy, thank you so much for sharing, Nancy. Whether you are glimpsing a life of meaning from the outside, standing at the precipice of a big, risky turn, or looking back and enjoying and remembering the changes you have already made in life, know that God goes with you. You are not alone. You have everything you need to take that big, risky step to say more to life. Now, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>